Our subject this morning, the doctrine of adoption. Or, how does one get into the family of God? Our text will be found in Ephesians chapter 1. We'll read verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him, in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Now in three of those verses I just read, we have five of the great biblical doctrines of the faith. Let me enumerate those. In verse 4, we have the doctrine of election. God chose us before the foundation of the world to be His very own people. That's the doctrine of election in verse 4. And then in verse 4, we also have the great doctrine of sanctification, that we should be holy and without blame. And then thirdly, we have the great doctrine of predestination in verse 5 having predestinated us. And then somebody said about that verse, before the beginning of time, before He laid the foundation of the everlasting hills, before the stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy, He saw and fixed our destiny in Christ Jesus. And then the fourth great doctrine is the doctrine we'll be speaking on this morning, it's found in verse 5, the doctrine of adoption. Unto the adoption of children. And then the fifth great doctrine is the sovereignty of God in verse 5, according to the good pleasure of His will. Now, those five great doctrines are the foundation stones of the plan of salvation. There are only two ways that you can get into the human family. Either you must be get into it by birth, natural birth, or you can get into it by adoption. Some people are adopted into families. And how does God place us in His family? By what process do we enter the family of God? The answer is in verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Now that raises the question, how does God become our Father? How do we become His children? Now it's obvious the Bible teaches both of those things. That God is our Heavenly Father and that we are His children by faith in Jesus Christ. So how does all this come about? How does it happen? How is it that poor sinners like you and I, wicked and vile, should find a place of favor among the children of God? What a stupendous act of grace it was when God chose you and I to be placed in His family and to become our Father and that we become His children. What a mighty act of grace that took. Jeremiah answers God's question like this. God said to Jeremiah, how shall I put thee among the children? 
That's adoption. And then he said, And I said, Thou shalt call me my Father, and thou shalt not turn away from me. That's regeneration. <clears throat> so how does God do it? He does it by adopting grace. This is a prophecy of Israel's future conversion. <clears throat> by sovereign grace and mighty power, God works out the miracle of salvation. He begins with adopting us as His children. Now, man cannot work his way into the family of God. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His grace He has saved us. And man cannot church his way in. You can't get into the family of God just by joining the church. And he cannot baptize his way in. Baptism will not put you into the church. He cannot buy his way in. If you had all the money in the world, you cannot buy membership in the family of God. And then he cannot pray his way in. We're not saved by prayer. We're saved by grace. Now prayer is a good way to begin, but we're saved by grace, not by our prayers. And then he cannot religion his way in. Religion will not take you to heaven. A person can have religion and never be saved. But true religion, the Bible says, is to visit the fatherless and the widows. Religion is something that everybody has. But not everybody is in the family of God. So religion does not put you in the family of God. It takes God's grace to put us in the family of God. God, how then, you would say, how does He get in there? If He doesn't get in by works or by church or by baptism or by buying or praying or by religion, then how does He get in the family of God? Well, the answer is very simple. God has to adopt him in. He adopts him in. Now, we all know what adoption is. If you don't have any children and you desire a son or a daughter, you go down to the adopting agency and you say to them, I would like to pick out a newborn child and make him my child and I want to become his parent and uh, show me the baby. And they show you all these little babies that have been born and that perhaps do not have parents. And uh, they say, now you can choose any one of these you want. And you look at these little babies and you say, I want that little baby right there. I want to adopt him into my family. I want to become his father. And I want him to be my son. And uh, I want to go down and draw up the papers and have this child become my child. My friends, that's what you have to do to adopt a child. And that is exactly, exactly what God did to put you in His family. He saw you through the eyeglass of eternity. He knew you before you ever came into this world. And He loved you. And He chose you. And He walked by all the babies of this world and his eye fell on you and he said I want that and he chose you and he also chose to adopt you now what God does in time is what he purposed to do in eternity anything that God does in time he has already purposed to do in eternity so your salvation and your adoption into the family of God was not an afterthought with God. It was pre-planned from the foundation of the world, the Bible says in verse 5. God had already set it all up. And so in time, He fulfills His plan to bring you into His family. Now to bring you into His family, He also has some obstacles to overcome. The fact that you sinned in your forefather Adam. The fact that you are a sinner by choice and by nature. And he can't take a sinner like that into his family. He has to clean him up. 
He has to make him a child of God and bring him into the family of God. And he overcomes those obstacles. How does he do that? By sending his son to Calvary's cross to pay the redemptive price, to settle with God the justice that we owed to God that we couldn't pay. And when Jesus died on the cross for those that he adopted, then God by legal action adopts them into his family and they become his. Now let's consider the meaning of adoption a little bit more. The word adoption is made up of a Greek word called huios thesia. It is made up of two Greek words. Huios is the Greek word for son and thesius is the Greek word for to place. So when you put those two together, it means to place as a son. To place him where? To place him in the family of God. So to place as a son is to place you into the family of God. Now in order for him to place you into the family of God, he not only had to adopt you, he had to regenerate you, he had to give you the new birth, but he also had to overcome your sinful reluctance and your rebellion against him. And he does that by an act of grace. He moves upon your heart and he draws you to the Savior. And you come willingly because God makes you willing in that day. And that's what it means to be saved. Now adoption means to place us as sons into God's family and means that God becomes our Father. Everyone is not a child of God. There are many that God did not adopt and did not save. But those of us that know our Lord, we are His adopted sons. Adoption, as the term clearly implies, is an act of transfer from one family, an alien family, into God's family. So God took us out of a bad family and put us in a good family. Put us in His family. There are only five times that this word adoption is used in the New Testament. It is used in Romans 8.15, Romans 8.23, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 10. It is only used in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. Now we come to our text this morning, Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Paul is writing to the Galatian church to explain to them how God brought this all to pass. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, causing you to cry, Abba, Father. Father, Father. Those are the words of a child of God. Father. Our God is a mighty God. He is a sovereign God. But He is also our Father. Jesus did not have to convince the Jewish people of monotheism, that is the belief in one God. They already believed in one God. But He needed to explain to them something about God that they did not know in the Old Testament. And that is that God is a father to His people. And when they asked the question, what is God like? Jesus answered the question with one word, Father. And He gave them a new concept of God. That God was a heavenly Father to those who believe in Him 
and who trust Him. So he says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son that we might receive the adoption of sons. I'm glad I have received that adoption. I'm glad there was a night when God adopted me into His family that He had already predetermined before the foundation of the world. And He said, because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That means Father, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Not only has He given you salvation, adoption, regeneration, the new birth, not only has He loaded you with those spiritual benefits, but He has also made you His heir. You have an inheritance and is freely given to you of God. <clears throat> Again, I read in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Oh, someday, we're going to stand in heaven and look into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll see Him as He is. God has a great family. In Ephesians 3.14, Paul wrote, For this cause, bow, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now his family consists of his sons and his daughters. I want to give you an illustration. To illustrate this, this is a true story. It happened in Chicago, Illinois, in America. And it illustrates how God became our Father. There was a ragged little newsboy who supported himself by selling newspapers. And one day as he passed this beautiful mansion with this freshly manicured lawns and its freshly trimmed shrubs and its stately mansion with its columns on the front porch. A luxurious mansion. And as he placed the paper on the front porch, suddenly on an impulse, he reached out and rang the doorbell. And then the door instantly opened and there stood a tall, distinguished looking gray-headed man by the name of Lowry. Mr. Lowry. And Mr. Lowry looked at this little urchin and said to him, what is it son? What do you need? And the little boy, terrified at what he had done, said to him, sir, do you have a little boy? Mr. Lowry looked at him a moment and said, no, I don't have a little boy. He said, sir, I'd give everything I've got if I could be your little boy and if I could live in this great mansion and never be driven away and could stay here as long as I wanted, I would give everything I've got. And Mr. Lowry looked at him a moment and he turned around and he called his wife. She came to the head of the stairs and looked down and said, what is it? He said, dear, would you like to have a little boy? She took in the situation at a glance, realized what he was asking her, and said, yes, I would like to have a little boy. Mr. Lowry turned to that little ragged urchin and said, son, come on in. You're going to be my son. 
Tomorrow we'll go down and draw up the papers and you will be my legal son. And when I die and my wife dies, everything we have will be yours. And you will be the richest man in Chicago. The little boy, astonished, stepped into the great mansion and looked around. He couldn't believe what he had heard and what he was seeing. Mr. Lowry was the richest man in Chicago. And when he died, he left everything to that boy. And that's how that boy became the richest man in Chicago. Do you know how I became the richest man in Chiang Mai? Not with physical riches, not with money, but I became an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says so. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I have an inheritance right now. It belongs to me. The inheritance of salvation. The inheritance of being adopted into the richest family in all the universe. The family of God. And it would take hours and hours and weeks and months to enumerate all that's involved in that inheritance. But we have it. You have it right now. And you will see the realization of it when you're in His presence. Now there is a time period concerning adoption. It has three phases. First of all, it has a past phrase. When did God plan all this? Back in eternity past. Ephesians 1.5 says, Having predestinated us under the adoption of children. You see, God planned everything that transpired. All that transpires in time, He purposed in eternity past. So the case stands thus. Before ever I had the chance, either in Adam or by my own willful act, to take the position of a sinner, showing myself wholly undeserving, He gave me the position of a son, setting me down in the family register. His very own. A son to himself. This was his good pleasure to will. Therefore it must come to pass. Whatever God wills will come to pass. What a wonderful security my salvation is made to rest upon. So that was something God did in the past. He adopted me. He chose me. And then in the present it has a the relevance for the presence. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. He's already done it. That we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. That's the presence. Paul said in Galatians 4, 6, Because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Our Father, Our Father. Then there is a, not only a past and a present aspect of it, but there is a future aspect. Romans 8, 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, one of these days we're going to be manifested to the world as the sons of God. God is going to show us off as His sons to a wandering world. He will manifest Himself and us to the world as sons of God. Right now, we are hidden from the world. The world doesn't see us for who we are. The world doesn't know who we are. They do not understand that we are the sons of God. And in Romans 8.23, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan 
within ourselves waiting for the adoption. Now, the adoption here is speaking of that new body we're going to have when the manifestation takes place. We shall be changed for our way of life in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. Someday these old bodies that are worn out and tired and full of illness, full of disease, and full of incapacity. One of these days, these bodies will be made new bodies and we'll live in them for all eternity. And they'll be young and strong and all the marks and blemishes will be gone and we will have a body like Jesus had when He rose from the grave. What a wonderful prospect we have to look forward to. This old tenement house we're living in is decaying day by day. We're getting a day closer every day to the grave and to heaven. But one of these days, there will be a resurrection of the body and we'll come forth from the grave with new bodies and we'll live in them for all eternity. Now there is an order or a sequence to all of this. It involves adoption and regeneration. The adoption, we already have it now. We have adoption right now. The Bible says, now are we the sons of God. But regeneration is something else that we have right now. And it is required of us to be regenerated to enter the kingdom of God and heaven. There is an order and a correspondence between adoption and regeneration. I've already explained the meaning of adoption, but regeneration is also called the new birth. Jesus said you must be born again. Now adoption is God's will in eternity past. Regeneration is an act of God's work in us in time. Adoption is the cause. Regeneration is the effect. Sinners are not adopted because they're regenerated. Sinners are regenerated because they've been adopted. Adoption gives us the name of sons. Regeneration gives us the nature of sons. Adoption gives us the title to our inheritance. Regeneration fits us for that inheritance that we might enjoy it. Adoption is the son placing, the weostasia. And regeneration is the son making. He places us in his family as a son. Then he makes us a son by the new birth, by regeneration. And Galatians 4, 6 tells us, Because ye are sons, in an adoptive legal sense, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts in a regenerating sense, crying, Abba, Father. Why do we pray this way? Our Father which art in heaven. We pray that way because Jesus taught us to pray that way. And the first thing that He taught His disciples about prayer was to address God as our Father. Our Father which art in heaven. Only a child of God can do that. Children of God address Him as their Father because they know He is their Father. They know He is that they are His children. Let me repeat this once more at the risk of being thought teaches. Everything God does in time, in time, is what He purposed and planned in eternity. If you get hold of that, it will help you. It will really thrill your heart to realize that everything He's doing with us in time is what He planned to do for us in eternity past. The old Baptist confession of faith, I call it the Philadelphia Baptist confession of faith, has these words about adoption. All those that are justified... God promised in and for the sake of His only Son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption, by which they are taken into the number 
and enjoy the liberties and privileges of children of God and have His name put upon them, they receive the spirit of adoption, they have access to the throne of grace with boldness, they are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, they are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by Him as a Father, yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption, and inherit the promises of heirs of everlasting salvation. That's the old Philadelphia Baptist Confession of Faith, over 200 years old. Now there's an important distinction between the sonship of Christ and our sonship. God the Father is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is also our Father. But in a little different sense. Because Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He's always been the Son of God. He didn't have to be brought into the family. He's always been in the family. He is eternal. But we are adopted into the family as natural sons and brought in spiritually into the family of God. So we have two different sonships in the Bible. The sonship of Christ is His eternal essence with the Father. And our sonship is that which was bestowed upon us by grace. <laughs> Jesus is not an adopted son. He's the eternal son. And there are those that are making the mistake today of teaching that Jesus was adopted just like we are. That's false. Jesus is eternal. He never had a beginning. He'll never have an ending. He had a beginning as a man. As a man, He was born in Bethlehem. But that which was born in Bethlehem was also the Son of God who never had a birthday and never needed one. So we want to keep separate our sonship from His sonship, although it is true that His Father is our Father and we are His children. The Bible says, "For which, uh, To which of the angels said He at any time, Thou art My Son, this day have I begotten Thee, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth his first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. Thy th but under the sun, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. You see, the sun is forever and ever. Thou art. My son, this day have I begotten thee. What does that mean? It's eternal generation. The son is eternally generated. That is, he has eternally been. He didn't have to have a beginning. Then quickly, the witness of the evidence of adoption. You say, preacher, how do I know if I've been adopted? If I haven't been adopted, I won't be in the family. How do I know if I've been adopted? Very simple. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you led by the Spirit of God? Does He lead you day by day? Do you trust Him for leadership in your life? Then you're a son of God. And if you're a son of God, you've been adopted. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, wherein we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit whispers to my heart, you are a child of God. God is your heavenly Father. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You know, it's a wonderful thing. Captioned in these bodies of flesh, sinning quite often, failing God quite often, yet, yet, 
the Spirit of God who dwells within us encourages us and shows us that we've been forgiven and that we're saved. I think the hymn writer understood it when he penned that hymn, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses and He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me I am His own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. There is a fellowship between us and our Heavenly Father that the world knows nothing about. They don't understand it. They've never experienced it. That's why they don't understand it. But if you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. He is in you. If you're a child of God, if you've been saved by God's grace, He's in you. And He whispers these sweet poems to your heart. I think of Hattie Buell. Hattie Buell wrote a hymn one day expressing her fellowship and her confidence of who she was. This is what she wrote. A hymn called The Child of the King. My Father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in His hands. Of rubies and diamonds and silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. My Father's own Son, the Savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now He is pleading our pardon on high while patiently we wait till He comes by and by. I once was an outcast, a stranger on earth, a sinner by choice, and an alien by birth. But I have been adopted. My name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe, and a crown. A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, Yet still I may sing, Oh, glory to God, I'm a child of the King. A child of the King. A child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Can you say that this morning? Do you know that this morning? If not, you can know it. It's so simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means trust Him and thou shalt be saved. And then you can sing these songs and mean them. You can experience that fellowship, that divine fellowship. Why did that hymn writer wrote, What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. How did he come to write that? Well, he'd been having fellowship with the Lord, and he put his thoughts down on paper. And you can go through the hymnal and all the way through the hymnal, these hymn writers are expressing the love of their heart for their Heavenly Father and their gratitude for what He has done for them. On the divine side, as His children, we have His fatherly love. He loves us with an everlasting love. A love that can never be quenched. As His children, we are the subjects of His fatherly care. Jesus said, Think not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, for your Father knoweth you have need of these things. As His children, we are subjects of family discipline. One fellow said to me one time, If I believe like you Baptists, I just sin all I want to. I sin more than I want to, don't you? More than I want to. You see, when you're saved, you don't want to. Sometimes you do, but you don't want to. As His children, we have a deliverance from slavish fear. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. As children, we receive the witness of the Spirit. I just spoke on that. As children, we receive the fatherly inheritance. How rich you are if you're a believer. How rich you are this morning. 
My Father is rich in houses and lands. He holds the wealth of the world in His hand. You are somebody this morning. Do you realize who you are? Do you realize what you are? A child of God? A son of the Father? Oh, if the world only knew who we were. They don't know. On the human side, we have the family name. They were first called Christians at Antioch. As sons, we have the family likeness. But we all with open face, beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Every time you look into your Bible and you read a few passages of Scripture in the Bible, God is transforming you into His image. And daily as you walk with Him, as you read His Word, as you obey Him, you're being changed into His image. There was a missionary in the village. And he had been teaching the people. And a little girl from that village went over to another village. And she heard another village talking about Jesus. And, she, and he described Jesus in the second village. And he says, does anybody know where Jesus is? She said, I know where Jesus is. From the description you gave me, He's in our village right over here. She meant that this man was so like the description the other man gave of Jesus that He must be Jesus. Well, i got a long way to go yet. Sometimes I still lose my temper. Sometimes I'm not everything I ought to be. Sometimes I sin. But I have a heavenly Father who looks upon the blood that His Son shed on the cross. And He said, I forgive you. It's alright. You asked me to forgive you, and I do. And you're forgiven. It's okay. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. We have as sons the family likeness, and we have the parents' nature. You see, what God does to make it possible to live the Christian life is that He imparts His nature into us. See, God cannot lie, the Bible says. God cannot do anything wrong. And that perfect, holy nature of God, He imparts that into us. Now, we can quench it, we can put it down, and we can push it away, but it's there. We can't get rid of it. Once we've been born again, we can't be unborn. And that nature is in us. And if we obey the Lord and walk with the Lord and obey His spiritual leading, then that nature that He's put within us will begin to take control of our spiritual lives and we'll live like we ought to live. And then last of all, as His children, we are the subjects of His fatherly comfort. My first wife passed away ten years ago and I stood by her casket and told her goodbye. And somebody came up to me and said, Preacher, we're sorry you lost your wife. I said, I didn't lose my wife. He said, we just buried her. I said, I didn't lose my wife. When you lose something, you don't know where it is. I know where she is. I didn't lose her. I'll meet her again someday. And then God gave me another wonderful wife to be a helpmate. And as I stood by that cast, the comfort that only God could give came into my heart. And He whispered to me, it's all right. It's all right. I don't make any mistakes. And that fatherly comfort is worth more to me than all the gold in the world. I have a father who cares for me, who watches over me, and who loves me. Even when I was unlovable, he loved me. And even when I fail him, he still loves me. I'm his son. I'm his son.
Are you his son this morning? Or his daughter? You can be. He has promised that if you will receive his son as your savior, he will become your father. I wonder this morning if there's one that would do that. That is my prayer. And that is why I preach this message. That you might understand how to get into the family of God and be a child of God. As we bow together in prayer. Brother Jim, this morning would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Thank you, Father.